your guides to a really great financial future. Tom and Don are talking real money. Two weeks have already passed, and just like that, it's time for another Talking Real Money, Sound Investing, Super Duper Podcast, Video Cast, all kinds of cast, just for all of you. We want to thank you very much for uh, visiting us on our, our little get together, whether it's via audio or on Paul's YouTube channel or our YouTube channel, Talking Real Money. I'm Don McDonald, and I am joined, I'm so excited to be joined by, once again, Mr. Pablo Merriman. Happy to be here. What a what a joy, really. Okay, not really, really but you know that, but I'm here. Didn't sound, <laughs> did that sound sincere, Tom? It was that close to sincerity. Like so that close. close. And, right and, there. And right there in the other screen, that is our good friend Thomas Seacock, or we just call him Tom. And you know I am happy because I'm just happy to be anywhere at my age. So thank you for allowing me to be on this podcast. We're just happy you're still awake at this late hour it's on an afternoon. getting pretty close to... Yeah, yeah. It's... Have you noticed, Don, that Tom has to wear a tie to work? Huh? Uh-huh. He, he yeah. has no yeah. idea what it's going to be like when he doesn't have to wear a tie. He'll I am going to wear... every week... My grandson now wears a tie on weekdays. It's just, I'm going to be wearing a tie the rest of my days. I'm good with that. I'm okay. And I believe he will. You know, he calls me from his home office, and he's in a tie, three-piece suit, you know. And, what can you say? What can you say? <laughs> Paul, Paul looks like a lumberjack. Oh. I look like, I don't know, <laughs> some sort of a beacon. Uh... <laughs> What are we talking okay. about? Come on, guys. We have a topic, and this is a, a this is a great one. Today's topic for the Talking Real Money Sound Investing multicast. Ooh, I'm going to use multicast now. You don't like the Marvel multiverse? We're the multicast. On today's show, the topic is three money myths debunked. And we've each had the opportunity to choose one of our favorite money myths. And then the challenge is for each of us to debunk that money myth. Mm. And of course, because it's age before beauty, we will start with Tom. No, uh, we'll start with Paul. Paul, what is your money well, myth, Well, you know what I'd like to talk about is this myth that I hear from people all the time. They tell me they do not believe in market timing. They only believe in buy and hold. And of course, as you two guys know, I've been around the market timing part of this industry for, in a way, for 50 plus years. And I know what market timing is. And I can tell you that market timing is any kind of movement within your portfolio because you think that you'll make more money doing that chasing performance, going to the hottest sector, maybe moving out of the market when the market is in decline. Now, what most people say, and by the way, it isn't just most people. Merrill Lynch would say this. Virtually every major brokerage firm would say, we do not believe in market timing. But what is it they actually recommend to people? in order to get people to do something, to move around, because that's when they make their money, they recommend people do market time. They'll encourage people to maybe be adding value these days, getting out of growth, maybe going overseas, maybe moving into fixed income. But what is so fascinating to me is they never call it market timing because they know that's a dirty word, but it's what Tactical it is. Tactical allocation. Tactical asset allocation. Exactly. Tactical <laughs> asset allocation equals market timing. What is the evidence, though, Paul, that market timing doesn't work? Well, I'll tell you the evidence, and, and, and I'm sincere about this because half of my retirement is market time. So what market timing is trying to do is to lower the risk in your portfolio by stepping aside from time to time, in my particular case, because of 
trend following market timing systems. There's no, there's no magic formula. There's, there's, there's no way that anybody knows when to be in at the bottom, when to be out at the top. Hold on. I have got to stop you there for a minute really? though. Now everybody watching at home or listening in their car is saying, wait, did Paul Merriman just tell me to time the market? No. No, Paul Merriman just, just said, said half of my money is in market time. Yeah, but let me tell you what I believe. I believe that 99 out of 100 people who try market timing will fail. That is the evidence. I've seen it my whole career. And in fact, we can even see that in the returns of mutual funds when they track the returns of the shareholders, not the fund itself but the shareholders, because the shareholders in those mutual funds tend to get in high, tend to get out low. That, of course, they don't call it market timing, but that's what they're doing, whether they're using what I call the I can't stand it anymore market timing system or some other. They've read something. They've heard something that means you got to get out or you got to get in. Well, but does that mean, so I guess what you're saying is that in mass, that people can't beat the market. But are you saying there are ways that you can effectively market time? You see, Don, you just used the phrase, beat the market. None of the money that I have invested with market timing is designed to beat the market. It is attempting to be in the market when it's going up generally, but out of the market for a portion of the major catastrophic event, which unfortunately we never know when that's going to happen. And that is, by the way, one of the reasons that so many people give up on market timing is because it doesn't work, and then it doesn't work, and it doesn't work. People, but would you suggest someone follow that that they that they try to? Because everybody says I love being in when it's going up. I just don't want to be in when it's going down. You know why I don't think they should try it, Don, is because it requires uh, uh, an 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 amount a low low low. Or let me say this, high, high, high control of your emotions. And if you want to be on the right side of the market most of the time, you probably better be a buy and holder. I think 99.9% .9 of people could buy and hold. I think 1% of people will maintain a market timing strategy that recall, re, requires you take losing trades, requires you buy into the market when it's higher, and then get out when it's lower. It requires movement that is just emotionally unacceptable to investors. So you're like the, you're like the Warren Buffett then of market timing. I, he could <laughs> well maybe that would be so e okay. except i don't Let me... i don't do my own market timing because if i tried to do it i'd be one of those emotional slobs that can't do it and let me then let me just first of all when i heard paul say timing i thought this was about personal relationships somehow i thought it was a different podcast but that's another <laughs> equation uh and paul and i were actually at a market timing convention once i don't know if you remember this and we were at a table with eight or nine other timers. And one of them got, a, I think it was a page to go sell something, went back to the phone to make the trade, came back to the table. And I asked him how the trade goes. No, I, 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 over, I overruled it. It, it. it doesn't make sense right now because it, it doesn't make sense most of the time. So I agree with you. People can't do it. Um, even if you give them a simple 100-day average to, you know, just add up the market for a hundred days, the, the, you know, a divide by a hundred, give you a number. If it's above, you're in, if it's below, you're out. Most people simply can't do That's that. Right. But I will say this, most people are market timers. It just depends on what your notion of timing is because people are buying and selling securities. People are taking money out of their accounts for a variety of reasons. And oftentimes they're going to say it's because they need the money or whatever, whatever. But the, the work that I've seen from clients is at the end of the day, they believe something. They believe, as many people believe today, those markets got to go down. 
It's gone up so fast in the last year and a couple of months. It's got to go down, Tom. So I want to get some of my money out. Well, that's market timing. It, it, you Small cap value. I mean, I just looked it up. It's up over 100% yeah. in the last year. Yeah. You got to sell it because it just can't keep going up that way. Well, that's market timing. What you're talking about is an algorithm, a, an actual numbers where you look at the numbers and you make a decision. And you point out the great point. You don't make that decision anymore. Somebody else makes that, a computer makes that for you. And then you have to agree to follow that because if you don't, there's no reason. Then it's just an emotional roller coaster. So most people, I agree, cannot market time. Most people do market time, whether they think they're timing or not. And the reality is, 99, I agree, 99% of people could be good buy and holders if they understand the volatility their portfolio will face in whatever crisis mm. is next. I think it's important then that, Paul, yeah. restate your busted myth. So what I got, and I think this is what all of the folks at home got, is that the myth is market timing can be an effective strategy. Is that what you were saying? Uh, actually, the myth, as or, far as I'm concerned, what's the, myth? the myth is the belief that people believe they are buy-in holders. They don't think market timing works. That's what they say. But they don't act that way, Don. They act like market timers. I talk to people all the time. Okay. Sitting so the right myth now. is that people aren't are claim to be buy and holders, but in reality they're closet market timers and they're gonna do badly. And I and that's exactly it. And if they could just understand, like the people who've been sitting in cash for five years trying to figure out when to get in. And then I'll ask them, well. If you're not in and you get in, are you going to stay in? Well, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I just want to get in and then I'll be a good disciplined market timer. But what you, I mean, buy and holder. But then what you find out is the reason they're out is because they were a buy and holder gone bad and becoming a market timer. We really want people to take the time to figure out how to be a real buy and holder. Can I add then a subtitle to your myth? Well, but yes. The, the, the myth no. subtitle. <laughs> the myth subtitle is: We think we can control our emotions. Yeah. Yeah. We think we can. So the. All right. I'm ready for mine. I'm going to ask you a myth now. No. Are you well, ready? no, because mine okay. dovetails to this very, very well. That's all right. Well, Tom has myth number two. And by the Tom, way, I've got to give credit. The... Well, I've got to yeah. give credit to Paul because I had been thinking about rebalancing in the myths thereof. And he mentioned the fact that pe most people believe, the myth is most people believe that rebalancing means you beat the market. You make more than just having your assets exposed to the portfolio of stocks and bonds. I think, and, and by the way, I, thank you, Paul, for the idea. And, and I went back and read a very recent article by a guy named Simon Constable, who wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago, in fact. And um, in his article, he says, rebalancing is often seen by advisors and investors as a formula for consistent returns. Well, I don't know if that, I, and then he goes further to say, um, he does admit in the article, he has a quote, he says that, that someone says they have yet to see a study that shows that it improves your returns. But the gist of this article is that rebalancing costs you money. In other words, the fact that you sell something after it's gone up, the traditional thing is cut your losers short, let your winners run, right? That's the Wall Street adage. You let If something's going up and up and up, if it's Tesla, or Bitcoin or whatever it is. Well, those don't work. But anyway, whatever it is, right, you got to let that go. But the reality is, and, and we know this, is when you do that, there is another side to that mountain, right? I mean, things have a tendency to go this way and then they go that way. So it's not a good, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. Last spring, as you know, uh, we were with our clients and we were telling people bonds had gone up about 10% in the first mm. quarter in a couple of weeks, stocks were way down in early spring. So we were selling bonds 
and buying stocks, very counterintuitive because we're heading into this pandemic, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turned out that that was a great move uh, to make money. Yes, that was a very tactical, uh, tactically correct move. But it didn't feel like it at the time, and most people did not want to do it, in fact. They did not want to follow that that strategy. Now, what would you be doing? Well, you'd be selling stocks because stock, especially, and I just looked the price up, uh, Avantis' small cap value stock has gone from 38 to 79 in the last, Mm. uh, pardon me, uh, ETF has gone from 38 to 79 in the last five and a half months. Mm -hmm. So you'd be selling that and buying bonds that are making nothing or actually down a little bit for the year. Does that sound like something you want to do? Most people don't want to do it. So I think, again, the myth, Don, is rebalancing makes you more. No, rebalancing should be so that you stay within your plan. Rebalancing, so for me, is you're taking the winners off the table, putting them in your pocket if you're paying yourself out of the portfolio, or you are staying to your correct asset allocation. Most people we know, by the way, because we see it regularly, most people, by the way, Paul, will follow your philosophy. They might buy the right funds and then they never rebalance. Or as you said, when we started all this, when the crisis hits, they will sell the thing that has gone down and buy the thing that has gone up because that makes them feel better. So they, they're traditionally individual investors are very poor rebalancers. It is a strategy I think you should use, but you should not use it to make more, what you should use it is to stay in your plan and keep your correct asset allocation. Can can I uh, just talk about a common thing regarding the rebalancing that comes up? Uh, And that is not a to rebalance or not to rebalance, but a lot of people believe you should rebalance more often. And we did a study that compared an annual rebalance with a monthly rebalance using a group of equity asset classes over a 51-year period. And what we found was that the equity group, as a group, compounded at 12.4% based on annual rebalancing. Now, using those exact, exact same asset classes over that period, if you rebalanced monthly, it compounded at 12.1, three-tenths of 1% less. Now, that sounds like a small item, but it turns out it's actually, if you can make an extra three-tenths of 1% and not have to rebalance every month, which takes time and costs money, but the standard deviation was lower. When you rebalance more often, you're taking less risk which is the reason you get a lower return. Which is interesting because it points out something very fundamental about investing. Everything is a series of trade-offs. If you want higher returns, you have to take more risk. If you want less risk, you have to sacrifice some returns, which leads us right to my myth, which is, I'm entitled to a high return on my investments. You hear all the people, you've heard them, Paul, Tom, where people are going, I, you know, I used to get such a high return on my, my CDs at the bank or on my treasuries, or and now I don't get them anymore. I'm being cheated. This is not fair to us poor fixed income investors, as if yeah. there is some entitlement. Yeah. There is no. Go ahead. No, I, There's I, no interest rate entitlement. I, 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 I think this has been the plague for the retirees who have had all their money in fixed income because in the previous long cycle, they did just fine. And now they're stuck in an asset class that may actually be running them out of money before they run out of life. And that's a scary thing. And what they want back is what they had before. And that's yeah, but the before is really interesting because the before is actually an aberration. The before that most of the pre-baby boomers, the the greatest generation and the and the older greatest generation or the earlier baby boomers, the yields that they received in the 1970s, the 1980s, 
even to some extent the 1990s, those returns were historically aberrant. People don't realize that for much of this country's history, real returns, and let's talk about what a real return is. A real return is the amount of money you get on your money, less inflation. What you have left to spend after prices have gone up. And the real return from uh, on your on your investments from about 1980 until let's say 2000 was in the 2 to 3 to 4 maybe 5% range hmm. but we forget that in the 70s when you were getting an 8.5% rate on your money inflation was over 11% right your real rate of return was a negative three. Whereas today, your real return after inflation, well, up until very, very recently, just 2021, prior to 2021, your real return after inflation was very close to zero. And I think, not if, you negative. Look at, I think if you look at the long haul, as far back as you can go from any of these asset classes, the real rate of return for stocks is somewhere between six and 7% annually. Mm -hmm the real rate of return for fixed income. Remember, fixed income is an implied IOU. There's some guarantee that stocks don't have. People have a tendency to forget that. Has been about 2 to 3%. And real estate, which today is, you know, hey, if I don't get my 20% increase annually on my house, there's something wrong with this. The real rate of return on real estate has been like 1%, a little bit over inflation. When you look at the whole country. I mean, I know on the coast it's been a little different, but people don't realize that, Don, because they have recency bias when it comes to real estate because it's been so easy the last three or four years, especially in the areas that we live in, to make way more than that. They have recency bias when it comes to the fixed income part, which has been crummy recently. But remember, even last year, bonds had a good year in 2020. It's a lot of complaining but the aggregate bond was still up, I think, 8 or 9% in 2020. That's pretty good recent performance. So I think everyone should take a deep breath, look at the long haul real rate of return of these asset classes, and be willing to accept it. Let me take you to task slightly on your real return on bonds. If you're talking about a real return on aggregate bonds, all of them from 30 days to 30 years, your two to three percent is accurate, but when I'm talking about return on on fixed income, I'm talking about the kind of return that most people who are on fixed incomes want, and that is the absolute 100% safe return of a CD or a one-year Treasury note, really safe. Okay, the I went back, I found a chart going back to 1873. And well, we can just ask Paul what it was like then. It, food was, uh, you could not find a good restaurant. Paul and I yeah. were out selling to stuff in the back of his life. wagon. We were making some money. Let me tell you the real rate of return. When you look at this chart over that period of time, the real rate of return is close to zero. Yes. It is really close to zero. Give you a couple of examples. After World War II, inflation skyrocketed up 19% in 1946, the real rate of return was negative 18% on treasuries. Wow. Negative 18%. In, in uh, 1918, right after World War I, the real rate of return on treasuries was negative 14%. It was negative, by the way, and I don't think most people realize this, in 1980. Yeah. The real rate of return on treasuries was negative 5.21, which, by the way, is lower, much lower than the real rate of return today. And you know, when we do planning for people, we there's a couple of ways the computer looks at returns. It looks at historic returns, which they, according to the people that write Money Guide Pro, they believe the future won't be nearly as good as the past. They 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 de they reduce a, a portfolio 60-40 by about 2% annually looking forward. They have no idea. We have no idea. Again, back to what you said where you started all this, Don. What people are mad or what they should expect is they don't know what they should expect because we don't know what to expect in any of these asset classes. They've been what they've been. I hope they continue to be that way. But in the reality, we really don't know.
However, let me tell you, based on history, if you want absolute safety for your money, absolutely, I don't want any risk of loss, then your expectation should be no return. Zero return. Well, and as it turns out, Don, I think if you look at the returns of intermediate bonds, you'll find that there is probably a, a fairly decent after inflation return there. I think it runs around 2% historically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and for people who do not... W- but those aren't riskless. Well, there... There is some volatility. There is very little, if, particularly if they're government... There's very principal little risk. principal risk on a on an intermediate. No, no, I'm not talking about principal risk. I'm talking about the volatility that where someone might see the their their portfolio and so down far this year, two or the, three or four yeah. percent. Intermediate term bond fund, the dimensional runs is down about three percent. So there are periods of time where, and if you go back to the mid '90s, you had a period of time where bonds, where this type of bond, safe bonds, lack of there's yeah. not not no principal risk. There's some because the U.S. government may or may not continue to be able to pay its debts forever. But you're right. It hasn't been much. But And by the way, we know, again, looking at a lot of portfolios, most people that we talk to need to make more than 2% a year to sustain themselves for a long period of time because that will not keep you up with inflation in certainly not in the worst of times, but maybe not in the best of times either. But doesn't the fact that intermediate term bonds may earn two absolutely safe securities should earn next to nothing after inflation. Doesn't that point out the need for the things that we talk about, all of us on our various programs, the need to build a better portfolio? Which means... GameStop, AMC, the real good stuff. uh, Don't listen to him. (laughs) I think that does mean that, that even the most conservative amongst us probably need to have... 20 to 30 percent in equities uh, at, a, at a minimum in order to make up that likely deficit that people are going to have to deal with. Because even if you have a bad period, typically, uh, that loss in the equities with that amount is not going to be catastrophic. But over the long term, does give you some growth, a little bit of gas, but a whole bunch of breaks still there. Uh, is better than than no gas at all, and and, and I will and all break. And, and yeah. I will reiterate something that we've said over and over, but I still see the mistakes made because I just met with someone this week. Who said I've been listening to Tom and Paul forever, and I looked at his portfolio. I said, when were you listening? Because they had high expense mutual funds where the average expense ratio was one and a half. Their diversification was 85% large U.S. firms and then a little tiny bit of small and a little bit of international. And they thought that they were 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds, and they were 80-20. So here's the thing. You need to know all those things at the very least, as you said, Paul, because otherwise you are you may lose way more than you anticipated at exactly the wrong time. Yeah, but here's a problem. There's another myth. It's fun to open up your portfolio statements and figure out everything you have. It's not fun, but you should do it. You've got to do it. Tom, what's your, you do, you do a spreadsheet every six months? I do a spreadsheet every six months, Um, but I could probably tell you what my money looks like more often than that. How often do you you check out your portfolio, Paul? Uh, I don't look at the portfolio uh, maybe once a year. I look at the portfolio. I know generally what I have because I've got a, a, a portfolio of index funds. And uh, as Tom mentioned about the good fortune for small cap value, because I've been such an advocate of small cap value and it has not been a great performer, I must mm-hmm. say that I've watched small cap value more recently uh, than I might have before. I mean, that's just an emotional thing. But I actually do not think about My port. The only time my portfolio, I should say, our portfolio, becomes a subject of of discussion, is when we want to go outside the budget. 
then it becomes a subject of discussion. All right, honey, let's look at the portfolio <laughs> again. I had a bad day with small cap value. It's not Chick Fil A tonight. It's you. Uh, you, uh, you. You. Did you get a lot of grief, Paul? Just want to. You mentioned that you know you've been a big advocate of small cap value for a long, long, long time. In the past 13, 14 years, haven't been particularly kind to small cap value. Actually, the past twenty. Um, have you been the subject of derision during that period? No, I wouldn't call it derision. Uh, I, I think I I know that people are disappointed when they don't see that that premium that they expected to happen quickly. I've worked real hard to show people that there are periods, very long periods of disappointment. For years, I've talked about the 30 years that small cap underperformed large cap from about 1970 through, I think, about 2000. And I relate the story about Dr. Fama when somebody complained about the fact that small cap had underperformed for so long. His response was, well, you're not very patient, are you? And that is something that uh, it's hard, but that's the way investing really is, which is why the three of us, regardless of how we might talk a lot about small cap value, uh, we we all believe in massively diversified portfolios mm-hmm. because there is no way to know when they are going to pop up or go down. And, and that's and by the way, we'd all three of us say without any question, every investor should have the appropriate amount of fixed income to deal with the downside when it happens. And and that's the only that's, reason for it. That's it. And all that's right. another part, another mistake people make too, is why is this part of the portfolio making money? This part's not. That's another thing you need to learn to ignore. Because people well, you need to look at your that. portfolio. It's like saying, uh, you know, you've got, you're like a, a millipede, and you got one leg that's not working well. Are the others working? If the whole thing's working, your millipede's moving forward. Oh, the old millipede uh, metaphor. The old millipede <laughs> analogy. <laughs> How long has it been since I've heard that one? Well, let me think. Not that I could have said centipede. Never. But I decided to give the millipedes a little bit of uh, a little bit of time. Attention. Centipedes get all the press. Oh, you guys are fun. Uh, Let's plug things. It's plugging time. Let's see. Let's start. Paul. Paul. Paul's got stuff. What do you got? I've Paul? got a book stuff. I've got a free book. I've got a free book. I got a wow. F- he got so excited. His voice went I know, up and off. I, know. I got a free book. Not only is it free, but yeah. it shows you 12 ways to make a million dollars more. Not one million, but a million for each of the the 12 steps that starting at age 82. Well, actually guaranteed. guaranteed. At paulmerriman.com backslash sign up. Now sign up means you're going to sign up for the newsletter, but I know what you folks do if you don't want to sign up for the newsletter, but you want to get the free book. You immediately unsubscribe as soon as you get the book. But when you get that book, your duty, your duty is to send it to at least 10 friends. That's the deal I'd like to make. And so what if go they ahead you... and unsubscribe, but send it to 10 friends. That's and what, what I... if they, instead of giving you the email, they give you their social security number. What do they get then? Well, they yeah. get a, they get a call <laughs> from, uh, from the, uh, the cartel. I see. Yeah. Okay. From which from cartel Cal- is the problem? From yes. Calcutta. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, well, and for those of you who don't know what we were talking about, if you're listening to the podcast, you wouldn't know. But if you watch the video, oh. because I'm going to put the pre show banter Uh-oh. in, oh, no. you'll actually know. <laughs> okay. You're mean. You know you're really story. mean, Don. Yeah, I know. Talking. I have control. <laughs> Cameras are rolling at all times. It's Pay a way attention. to get people to go to the okay. video. If you want the if you want the behind the scenes look at what we do when we make yeah. these, go watch the video. And uh, let's see. So at paulmerriman.com, Tom doesn't have anything to plug. No. Um, um I have a free book too. At vestry.com, talking real mo- or uh, financial physics. It's free. 
And, and by yeah. the way, I just reread that book yesterday, Don. I think it's terrific. I do. I think Thank it you. is terrific. I think the way you discussed risk uh, from many different viewpoints, that that's not a typical way that people think about the risks. I thought you did that uh, great job. Thank you. And Oh, and you can get a cooler version of it for free if you happen to use Apple Books. At the Apple Bookstore, I have an interactive version that's free. And if Tom and I, we used to be uh, at a registered investment advisory with Paul Merriman. Hmm. I'd forgotten Merriman that. Capital. Yeah. Well, I'm, because I'm sure you try too often. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, Tom keeps trying to forget. And I remind him, uh, Tom and I have a firm. It's called Vestry. Now Vestry by Appella. And we want to offer you something really special. And it is truly an offer. It is not a gimmick. We will help anyone, anywhere, anytime try to figure out what's going on with their portfolio or your hodgepodgery or how to get started on a plan or, you know, whatever it might be. We'll give you free time and we don't, don't, don't pitch you stuff. No sales pitch, no obligation, no cost. Now, will we manage your money for life for free? Are you nuts? No. <laughs> Maybe. No. You're listening you to the podcast. To, but do now, that. to be fair, Don, give me an idea because, because this is how I built my old firm was giving mm -hmm. free consultations Tell me about the consultation. Tom, tell tell yeah. Paul about your tip. Tom, Tom does these all day long. Tell him about a typical consultation. You know, there isn't a typical because I, I just talked to a 43-year-old engineer today who's been a saver who has two different retirement plans. And I all I did was say, rearrange, move all your money from one plan to another. So you have one plan. Here's how to build a portfolio. Get on with your life. On the other hand, we talked to a lot of people in their 50s and 60s who are within a few years of retirement. And in that case, we try to look at the retirement income part, Paul, looking at Social Security, pensions, how much you have saved. We'll actually build a, a 30,000 foot view for them in an hour or so, a little plan that says, here's when you should probably take Social Security, here's how you create income, and here are the fixes for your portfolio. Now, many people at that point say, you guys handle it. I, I don't want to deal with this. Other people will some, say, you know, some. great. And other people yeah. will say, thank you for your suggestions. I will get on with my life. So it depends on the person, but genuinely it is free. Genuinely, we do give you really, I think, really great advice. And as Don said, uh, we do not pitch you. We will say, here are the things to consider. Here's how you might change your life. But we do not, we're not strong armors. We're not uh, salespeople. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, that's great. Right. We kind of learned that from Paul because it is an effective strategy. I call it, it's sort of a Trojan horse. It's like, we will help everybody, and if we help you, let's say, Paul, we're, we're helping you. You're just the guy off the street, but he knew, knows a lot about money, comfortable managing your own portfolio with Vanguard or Fidelity or whatever, but you got a few things you don't understand, or you're really you're trying to get seriously into a retirement plan. You come to us. We give you this information. You go, thank you. I'm good. I'm going to go do it myself. What will happen when somebody comes to you because you know a lot about money? One of your friends from a club or at a you know at an event. What are you likely? Where are you likely to send them? Well, I, I totally agree. I, I that in fact that is that was the philosophy, uh, the belief that I had that eventually there would be a payback, and there was, and there mm -hmm. was, and you guys have had it as well. It's I know karmic marketing. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I'm I'm happy. It paid for, for that shirt, right? Kind of. This one? I think that might have been a gift. I'm kidding. This no, is not the, that shirt. Paul shirt. The, lumber, oh, the Paul, Lumberjack Paul. shirt. Thank I you I think you stole much. it off Al Borland or something, but anyway, oh it looks God. good on you, really. Al's a lumberjack. Well, you live out there in the woods. That's true. Look, so, uh, look behind him out the window. He's like logging. When he goes out, you hear this. There it is. There's the woods. Oh, right yeah, that looks good. Wow, oh, yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. A sneak peek. And then over here we have the water. I... Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, you're a disorganized mess hey, too. I like hey, that. I must have shown too much. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, right. thank you. You gotta go. Thank gotta you, go, guys. Thanks See you so much. See you in a much. couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, for us, go to vestry.com or talkingrealmoney.com. Make sure you subscribe to both Sound Investing, the podcast, and Talking Real Money, the podcast. And if you love what you hear, we all really enjoy the reviews. At Apple Podcasts, yeah. when you write those, we re they really do make our day. It's really and, nice. Thank and you. come to paulmerriman.com and and uh, we'll feed you lots of information. No personal advice. Wait, free steak dinners at paulmerriman.com? No, I think it's a cheese pizza. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I know the truth. Oh, you guys are Left wicked. Over. 
I look forward to our next meeting. Be well. All right, guys. Have a great one. Thanks for viewing this and listening to this or both. Take care. We hope you realize that the information provided on Talking Real Money is for educational and hopefully enjoyable purposes only. Providing personalized financial planning or investing advice takes time, so please consult with a really good fee-only fiduciary investment, tax, or legal advisor. We know a good one. Investing must always involve risk. In other words, you can and probably will lose money at times. Also, as much as you want it, no one can accurately, consistently predict the future. So past performance doesn't tell you a darn thing about what the future will bring. Unlike many other programs that say something similar, Talking Real Money is not trying to get you to buy or sell any financial products or securities. Instead, the program is provided as a public service by Vestry, a fee-only registered investment advisor. Thanks for listening, and please visit TalkingRealMoney.com for more information and disclosures. That's a wrap.